I would like to welcome everyone here to the October 16th um, community resources meeting. We are very lucky to have our state senator here. Um, but first, we should get this meeting to order. So, Laura, roll call, please. Um, Councillor Perry. Here. Councillor Elkins. Here. Councillor Mayori. Of course, not with us yet. And Councillor Jarrett. Here. Perfect. Well, this brings us to our public comment. I do not see any public in the building or on the internet. So it will be a very short public comment section. <clears throat> that being said, our next item is approval of the minutes of our last two meetings. I would entertain a motion to approve. Move to approve. Second. Or a roll call. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. That passes. <clears throat> Next on the agenda are updates and announcements from committee members. Does anyone else have anything to share? No. Well, it is my great pleasure then to introduce everyone to our Senator Joe Comerford, who's going to do an update on some state level actions and regional issues. I will turn the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you to the council members who are gathered here and online. Um, I'm so grateful that you're taking a moment to have this conversation and I appreciate you doing it in your committee, Mr. Chair. I, folks may know that the Senate convenes on Thursdays and my team and I were mindful of not asking for the city council's time and then canceling and then asking again and canceling. We thought it might be disruptive. So thank you, Mr. President, for working that detail out and Mr. Chair for hosting. Um, and I want to start by saying municipal work is the very hardest work in the Commonwealth. I see Councillor Nash shaking his head. I'm sure that sentiment is shared by all. There's just no comparison. Uh, between what you all bear on your shoulders and what someone at the state or federal level bears. And that's because all politics is local, all policy and spending is local. It all comes down to our neighbors and you are the embodiment of their concerns, hopes, and dreams um, in a way that, you know, folks at the state level or federal level, much as we try, you know, don't come, come close to the kind of intimacy and urgency and um, care, really, uh, that deep, local, rooted care um, for our neighbors' concerns. So I have nothing but admiration, and my team and I hope to do better by the city of Northampton and your work every day, um, because we know how hard it is. Um, and of course, I, you know, I also tip my hat to the school committee, also very hard. Um, my wife, Anne, is uh, putting her hat back in the ring there. Um, but, you know, any municipal body, city council, school committee, volunteer boards and commissions, these are very hard jobs. And I'm so grateful for the service. You you make the city go. And I happen to live here, so I'm your constituent. I'm actually Councillor Jarrett's direct constituent. Um, and then, of course, the at-large councillors. I'm your constituent, and I'm very grateful for your service. The city's better for you. Um so I did put together in true Virgo fashion um, a little slideshow, which I will present with your okay. Yes. Um, I think let's make this, uh, including the folks on online, let's make this more of a conversation than me just presenting at you. And of course, I'll try to go through it expeditiously so that we can have your questions and comments at the end, um, as well as all throughout. Okay. Um, and I should say that this comes, I, I am... Uh, I am meeting with each of the governing boards of the 25 cities and towns I represent. I'm in the back fifth. So we've completed most of these and I find them extraordinarily important. Um, I'll take copious notes and, you know, again, we'll um, do better because I've heard directly from you. Um, so this is our district. Some of you may know that in uh, 2020, we had a census every 10 years. As a result of the census, um, Frank, both Franklin County, but especially Berkshire County, lost significant population. And the Senate was faced with um, a choice. Uh, I was given actually a choice to um, take a map where Northampton went over to North Adams 
And, you know, the northern Berkshires up to Greenfield would have been my Senate district that I would have re rerun in. Or we could fight together to keep a seat. I voted to keep a seat uh, because keeping a seat is keeping a Western Mass vote, a chairpersonship, money in the district, a rural sensibility. And I thought that was really important. Um, then Senator Ann Gobi uh, was important in that effort. And Senator Hines, Senator Lesser, now former colleagues, although then very much, you know, part of the team, we linked arms. And I'm very, along with Senator Vilas, of course, Senator Gomez, and I'm very happy that we were able to keep a seat. It did mean that the district went from looking like a gorgeous V um, to looking sort of something like an eagle, I'd like to think. So the, <laughs> the end of that, the eastern tip in the northern belt is um, Winchenden. So I now stretch from Northampton to Winchenden. That's about an hour and 35, 45 minutes. Um, depending on Route 2 traffic. Now, why is that important? Well, the district got bigger. We added a town. I added four towns in Worcester County, um, which makes my foothold there stronger. But also, it, it really means I'm in a bigger geographic area. The district now stretches almost around the Quabbin Reservoir. It's how big it is. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's something for us to keep in mind. If we continue to lose population, which I'd love to talk to you about, our governing districts for all of your state and federal people get bigger. And every time we add another hour on the road, right, that's an hour fewer that I have to be in person, um, right, if we think of it like that. Now, we try to stretch the day like you do, um, but there's something for us to think about. There's also that many more municipal boards I have to talk with, fire chiefs, police chiefs, um, school committees, and with each of those, you know, getting our arms around the issues in front of us becomes more complex. Now, I am of a mind that um, our friends in Worcester County that are perhaps not as um, blue as Northampton voters, although we know that our district has, you know, people on all sides of all issues, I think they're making me smarter every day because, you know, they won't, they are um, sometimes very different than Northampton voters. And I think that's important for me to hear. It's just going to be, make me better at policy, having to see around an issue much more completely. Um, so what am I doing this session? Uh, so I'm the Senate chair of higher ed. I'm very grateful for these seats, by the way. I asked for these and I'm grateful to the Senate president for giving them to me. Um, I'm acting now chair of agriculture with Senator Gobi's departure to be rural affairs director. Woohoo. That's a good thing. I'm uh, acting, uh, no, I'm assistant vice chair of Senate Ways and Means. I've, I've been promoted to leadership. This is my um, third term. So I, I was glad for that. And then I asked to be on economic development and racial justice. Um, both of those committees, I'm also on rules and global warming and climate change. Global warming and climate change is not the telecommunications utility and energy joint committee where a lot of our bills that are consequential to Northampton, like some of your home rules are, um, but it is the Senate committee charged with things like the work I'm doing around um, carbon sequestration in buildings, that sort of the next generation from the net zero um, bill that I passed my first term. So it's good, it's good that they match what I think are my values, but also our shared values, right? I have to care about our economic development. I know you like, I want to care about racial justice. Rules are where it's at, right? Jim, Congressman McGovern will tell us they're the least sexy <laughs> committee that does the most work to shape what bills come to the floor, how they come to the floor, how debate is had, um, how transparency is had, right? So the, I, I really threw down this year on transparency and accountability in the Senate. I'm very proud of our Senate rules. And then, of course, the Global Warming Committee. So when I say I here, and I know you know this, but because you're my colleagues, I want you to see Jared Friedman as our chief of staff, Brian Rossman as ledge director, Elena Cohen, who probably you hear from most as district director. She's awesome. Um, Rachel Klein does constituent work and Caitlin Billings does communication engagement. Um, not every Senate office makes up the same, the committees, uh, not committees, the office the same way. But, but I do, and I like this setup. I like our investment in engagement and communications and transparency through our website and emails and forums. And I like our real dedication to constituent service. This is a public service announcement. I love constituent services. I think it's some of the most important work we're gonna do at a time where sometimes state government moves like cold molasses dripping upside down in a bottle, you know? Like, so if you have 
if you have issues, Councillor Elkins and I were just talking about this, if you have issues that require state and or state federal, or you need a nudge to our federal colleagues who I love, um, that's me. Text me, call me, send constituents my way. I'm proud of our record. We just closed, opened and closed 2,000 cases um, in our first four and a half years. Um, that's a nice pace for our team. Uh, many of these are in Northampton. Um, so we do municipal, regional, community business work. That's part of what we do. Um, and that's everything from figuring out the grants to regulations, policies, laws that have to be changed, engagement with local and federal um, constituent services. We talked about policy making. That's bills I file, including your home rule petitions um, that you send us. Um, but Rep. Sabadosa takes a lead as a House member, but you know we have a role to play, although not as heavy a lift um, in the Senate uh, as the reps have because they lead off. Um, so I tip my hat there. But I, you know, if I'm sleeping at the job, um, it's not a good thing. So we don't do that. We we attend to your home rules with you. Um, uh, so I file bills. You care about the bills that mm -hmm. come to the floor that are not my bills. Um, so I, I engage on them on Northampton's behalf as well. Um, as pushing my agenda. My agenda is your agenda. I get ideas for what bills to file from you, actually. Um, the the issues that you, this council, certainly Mayor Shara, and I should have mentioned Mayor Shara in my opening remarks, I have the highest regard for the mayor. Um, you know, I get ideas. My agenda is grounded deeply in the 25 communities I represent. Of course, budget and bond bills, I'm, I am like the Lady Macbeth of budgeting, um, meaning I really am ambitious. Um, I don't. Hopefully, I don't go as far as Lady Macbeth did. But uh, what I mean to say here is, you know, I really believe, and I'm going to. Sh I'll show you a, a partial list of what I've been able to bring home. Part of my job is money. It's both getting you access to budget dollars in the form of state line items, and I think we're going to talk about that. For example, the Department of Community Care and how the heck we're going to continue to fund that. Um, uh, and the Equitable Approaches to Public Safety grant, which is currently funding it. Um, and then also um, the earmarks. Earmarks are small compared to the vast billions, but still I have a role to play to prioritize communities like Northampton. Um, and bond bills, which we can go into at greater depth if you're interested, they're tricky business, but they do yield. Um, bond bills are a little bit smoke and mirrors, Um meaning they're part of a process. And if you want a bond earmark, it's my job to get one for you, but it's not in any way guaranteed, but it is a puzzle piece in a large labyrinth of puzzle pieces that we bring together. Here's an example, the French King Bridge. We just were up at the French King Bridge to um, commemorate suicide barriers being put up. And um, it was very poignant and very moving and really long process in getting those done. And I had a puzzle piece to bring, right? I had to work with our colleagues at MassDOT to prioritize this among many other priorities. And then I had to secure a $3 million bond line item so that if they needed to, they could borrow against it to get the work done. Um, so it itself wasn't released, but MassDOT knew it had it in its back pocket. So it's part of an overall strategy that I work with with communities. In those cases, it was Irving and Gill um, with Northfield as a, as a partner. Um, and then, of course, communications and engagement. I should say all my votes are online. Every single letter I write is online, unless it's to like a an application for a job for an intern, you know, or, you know, um, individual recommendations for students I don't put online, but every other piece of correspondence I write. And that's because I think you should know who I'm writing to, why I'm writing them, um, because you may not agree with me. And then I should hear from you. You should also know every single um, vote I take. Um, they have to be public to you. Um, so anyway, they're, they're all there, um, plus a bunch of other things that are regular updates. Um, and we do other things like town halls and stuff like that. Okay, so, you know, thinking about the money, um, we have passed this $56.5 billion budget. We did, as part of that, include $1 billion in fair share money. As you know, when we were campaigning in Northampton, fair share was... Um, slated, you know, two summers ago, last summer, rather, no, two summers ago, um, it was slated to be $2 billion. Um, and um, I believe we will get to $2 billion. I do. Um, they, this was a conservative estimate for this budget. And we'll see it, I think, we'll, we'll see us, I predict, having to go back 
and appropriate more money because we can't do anything but spend fair share money um, on transportation and education. One thing to know about fair share money is when it was initially before the legislature, and I voted on that in um, constitutional conventions before it went to the ballot, um, when it was initially before the legislature and we were doing what was called the Student Opportunity Act, we thought that fair share would be needed to pay for Chapter 70 general funds. That is not the case. Our budget currently is robust enough to encompass all education spending. So, for example, fair share in this cycle was used for things like universal free school meals, right? So that $168 million, for example, was part of that. And of course, some of that is benefiting Northampton, um, as well as every other school district in the Commonwealth. So, you know, it's, uh, it is difficult to get our minds sometimes around um, uh, around fair share as, as an entity, but, you know, the 1 billion we're spending is very small compared to the overall budget. So I, in my mind, try to put it into perspective. And it's also, again, really important for us to know that it was initially to pay for the Student Opportunity Act. We do not need that now because our general fund is robust enough. Um, and then we did this tax package you may have heard about. The tax package was in some ways controversial. Um, and in the end, it's it, when it gets fully funded, it's going to be about $1.1 billion in tax expenditures, meaning you know we won't get that revenue. Um, however, some of that goes is revenue that goes directly to the rainy day fund. So the short-term capital gains um, tax that we gave a cut to um, goes directly to the rainy day fund. That's where that capital gains revenue goes to. So it's not a direct on budget expenditure loss, um, but I care about rainy day. I know you do too. Um, so it's something for us to be really mindful of that. Um, as you know, that was an up or down vote by me because it was a conference committee. The Senate passed our version of the tax cuts um, didn't include um, some of the, uh, I'll call them mo more egregious tax cuts for the wealthy. Um, I, I do not favor them, but in the end, there was a compromise bill between House and Senate, and um, that's how it went. There is a lot of relief um, for working and low-income people uh, that I'm very proud of, including for elders and students, renters. Um, I'm very proud of that. And you can see it on a blog. I detail on senatorcomerford.org a blog on that. Um, so uh, this is a little bitly I made for the council. Hi, counselor. Um, this is a little bitly I made for the counselor. Um, with all of the bills I filed, there are summaries available for all of those bills. And I'll make sure that um, Laura gets this presentation so she can get it out to the um, council. I see you shaking your head, Laura. Um, but suffice to say, I focus again where you focus, um, education, climate, health care, economic development, affordable housing, transportation. Those are the places that I have um, I have focused. Uh, so for example, um, in education, I focus on special education a great deal. And that's in part because it's a piece of reform that is very sorely lagging and shame on us um, for having an assumed threshold for special education students rather than allowing municipalities to count actual special education students. There is not one district in the Senate district, not one school district in the Senate district with special education levels below at or below 16%. 16 is the new threshold. That means that any Delta is paid for by the municipality. Um, and that's money that the municipality doesn't have to do other things. Now I could use your help um, with th some of the issues that we're going to talk about tonight. Every time you raise your voice as a council, which you do beautifully and often, it is useful because I can go to Senate leadership and say, look, this is you know a large city I represent, and this is the council's voice. Um, of course, I focus on climate resilience and mitigation. Um, I did a lot of uh, work with solar in the last uh, session successfully, um, thanks to people like Jonathan Wright, who pointed the way to blocks and solar development up at Hospital Hill. It was called single tax parcel. Jonathan said, this is what single tax parcel is. My head exploded with the complexity. 
we uh, wrote a bill and we passed it. Um, and now it's going to be more effective and efficacious for uh, individual homeowners on Hospital Hill to put solar on their house. They're going to get the benefits of net metering once we can rest it out of the DPU's hands. Uh -huh. um, but it'll happen. Um, and then we hope that it'll be more Northampton homeowners on single tax parcels like Hospital Hill um, will be able to get solar on their roofs and get the benefit. So we did a bunch of things like that. Um, healthcare equity, I have focused almost exclusively lately. Of course, I, I support Medicare for All, which I know many of you do, and many of the important healthcare reforms. But because I was public health chair for two sessions, I focused on the glaring absence of uh, cogent um, funded by the state, not only by the locality, which is what it was before COVID, um, set of standards and training and protocols for public health across the Commonwealth. We knew we didn't have them when COVID hit. And it, we saw the racial and economic disparities and how COVID hit pop populations. And shame on us, really, um, for knowing that inequity and not doing anything about it for so long. Um, so I have a bill that I pray is coming to the floor um, that will completely transform public health. Um, and uh, I've been focused on the funding, you know, inching it up, um, including an override of Governor Healy, respectfully done, override of Governor Healy's um, veto of public health back to get it back to 15 million, which is meaningful for Northampton. Um, so I focus there and of course, economic development, there's a bunch there, but I'll take your questions on all of this and move to the next slide. Um, uh, we, Jared and Elena and I, it's too small. You might want to look behind you, counselor, um, or on the screen. Um, I'm sorry for this. Jared, Elena, and I combed through our budget appropriations um, since 2019. And with the question, you know, what have we done that's helped Northampton? And we, this is a partial list of the money that we've secured. Um, I will just say that, you know, it looks like, for example, and you know, kudos to Northampton Chamber of Commerce. Vince Jackson said yes all the way do, through COVID, and he was able to be the conduit for money getting um, through the chamber to numbers of entities that needed it. Um, to you know, direct support for Grow Food Northampton, direct support for the marketing of Valley Flyer before it was a done deal. It was a pilot, and I used to say I had nothing to do with getting this pilot. I had everything to do with getting it secured and locking it. And so our team um, facilitated <laughs> weekly for Jared Friedman, and thank God he's young, meetings. Um, and then they became bi-monthly and then monthly with Amtrak and MassDOT. Um, and I secured money for the marketing campaign so that we could produce the ridership to demonstrate to Amtrak and MassDOT that in fact, um, there was reason to think this service should become permanent. Um, of course, there are entities here, you know, Children's Advocacy Center, which is up in Florence, David Ruggle Center. Um, the Department of Community Care was directly to the city. I think it was, was $150,000. That was when Mayor Narkowitz was um, first introducing it, and it was a budget hole. Um, we were able to help fill that uh, before the Department of Community Care got the um, equitable approaches to public safety money. Um, the Dial Self, of course, that's across the street from uh, Smith Vocational, Five Franklin. And here I would like to, you know, just commend the city's own commitment to Five Franklin, um, your commitment, the mayor's commitment. Um, and it was, you know, I felt really happy to be, I think we got about 168000 um, for that um, to help when, when Dr. Bossy was putting together the funding. So, you know, I wanted to back Northampton's commitment. Um, uh, the Safe Havens program is uh, needed about $422,000 to be able to increase the Safe Havens is low threshold housing. Um, so it's a really important entry housing for folks, especially who are currently houseless. Um, and it's uh, it allows for substance use and it allows for lots of comorbidities. It's really quite an important um, housing. Um, uh, and it, we, we, we didn't have enough of it in the region. Um, so I'll let you just, uh, I'll let you look at this list, but it just represents both, again, direct payments to the city um, and also just services in the city or nonprofits in the city that are quite important to us. Um, the Seven Sisters Midwifery is among the most recent, and that was 250000 for their doula program. 
you can pilot doulas, which is thrilling. Um, and you know, I'm I'm appreciative. I know you are too of Seven Sisters' work, the only freestanding um, birthing center in the Commonwealth currently. Um, and of course, the loss of Kirsten is tragic. Um, but we'll stay with them as they build back. Um, and then, of course, there's support for the region. This is a very small list. This is just the some of the lines that I know you've the mayor has talked to me about, or some of you have talked to me about over time. And we can go into greater detail there. Um, and then let's see. Oh, yep. Okay. And then this is just regional work and issues. Um, so, you know, as you might imagine, right, a Senate office, 25 cities and towns, five staff plus me, we have a role to play. I really do think of that as a role to play for like catching bigger issues and trying to you know, work with great, great colleagues. Oh, it's totally fine. Um, great colleagues on everything from um, regional rail, which we're working on now. Um, there was a rail commission, Rep Sabados and I were both on it along with Rep Lay. Um, uh, the report is coming out and, you know, I, I, I think we know it's gonna, what it's gonna say. It's gonna say that MassDOT's doing a lot of work and we have to figure out this, how we're gonna monitor and how we're going to run regional rail, right? Right now, there are four rail projects in the Commonwealth, uh, in our part of the Commonwealth. There's the Valley Flyer, north-south. There's the Southern Tier from Pittsfield. There's the Berkshire Flyer, which hooks up it's seasonal service, although I think the folks in the Berkshire would like it to not be seasonal. Um, and then there's uh, the Northern Tier. And the Northern Tier is a bill I passed. It's my first bill I passed. The study is actually clipping along. And it's, um, we're gonna have a meeting this week. You'll get an inv invitation to a public meeting. It's pretty exciting, some of the alternatives. These are not, we're not at war with each other, right? We're four counties we deserve to be networked, north, south, east, west. Um, you know, a penny of our sales tax goes to the MBTA, every one of ours. Um, I'm really favoring keeping that penny. Um, but we have, a, regardless, we have a right to robust regional RTA and um, rail service. So things like that. Um, we have a micro transit pilot up in Franklin County that we've funded through earmarks twice. That's very exciting that I hope to talk to PVTA about because sometimes we can't send the big old buses, but we can send zippy little Ubers, public Ubers, I call them. You know, so I think these are hopefully good, robust, useful things that we can do. And then, of course, you've got lots of priority issues that we've been privileged. Um, and that's just just a few of them up there. The mayor and Alan and Annie, you know, are really quite wonderful um, at uh, at being able to convey to my office, you know, the ways in which we should be jumping in to help Northampton. We have regular monthly meetings um, with the mayor and Alan. Um, they bring um, department heads as needed. Um, we have packed agendas and we work through them and it's everything from, you know, what the heck, how are we going to hold Coca-Cola responsible? Um, and so we've, you know, worked with Congressman McGovern and of course, Lieutenant Governor and the Economic Development Secretary, you know, at the mayor's direction to, you know, how are we going to pay for channel markers now that the vendor is changing the pricing structure because of a transfer of ownership of that company um, to flood relief to, you know, speed limits um, in front of um, Northampton High School, you know, which was a conversation with MassDOT. We're at regular, we're like, we're at Patty Leavenworth, who's the director of D2, who is a wonderful person was like, yeah, to Donna, why can't we do that? We can do that. Right. So sometimes it's, it's, it's nothing more than a conversation. Sometimes it's a piece of legislation. Sometimes it's, more than that, a meeting, but it's, you know, these are different um, different pieces of work that we've been engaged in, just some of the ones that Northampton, through the mayor, has brought to us. And again, I really commend the mayor for her uh, advocacy. And then this is super quick. You guys know that the legislation works along a two-year cycle. Um, so the budget, the bills that you filed as a city, the bills that you care about that I filed, any other bill is chugging along on this two-year cycle. I wish I could say that this session we've been more productive um, than, than I can tell you right now, but there's still time. So again, your advocacy is, um, I'm very grateful for. Uh, we should, we sh 
this because it's the, it'll be the second year of a two-year session. By January 31st of 2024, we should conclude all really meaningful business. Um, we'll still work all the way through it, but it's something for us all to, it's a clock that's in my head that um, I can't get out. And then the state budget process, this is just coming to you. Um, just so you know, right now, the agencies are sending the governor their budgets for fiscal year 25, which will pass and be, you know, will be law, God willing, by July 1st um, of 2024, right? Um, so as Northampton thinks about your own advocacy for the things that are important, you know, it's good. And again, I can help with this to begin now talking to um, state colleagues for the programs that you think are the most important to the city, um, because they will then begin putting their budgets together to give it to Governor Healy for her um, budget, which will be out in January. Um, and uh, the whole process um, begins anew. Um, and then this is our contact information again, our cells and our emails and this will come to Laura for the council and and this is our office um so it's room 410 and you should come anytime um so uh yep that's us that's me waving right there um so uh with that I'm sorry that um I didn't pause long enough for you to ask any questions but I'm happy to have them now yeah, I, I can get us rolling here. So first of all, thank you for that update. You are quite busy yourself. <laughs> and um, and I, I I speak for all of us here. You, you've done, uh, from the, the day you were elected, you've been in motion and getting stuff done. And, yeah, do. um, and, and oh. Thank you. And getting stuff done on, thank you. <laughs> on a big level and on a local level. So um, I wanna thank you personally for the work you did with me around um, the signage at Coca-Cola, yep. that we had a lot of problems with the trucks. We still do, but uh, Senator Comerford helped open up communications uh, with MassDOT um, and, um, and we were able to get new signage on the exit ramp to direct tr the trucks towards Damon Road. Uh, Senator Comerford was also really helpful in terms of we had trains that would come in idle. They would park because the, it's a long story, but the, the trains could sit there all weekend idling over right off of Holly Street uh, uh, next to the lumber yard and just, you know, two... <laughs> Two engines rumbling and uh, billowing all, all of the diesel, and um, she helped us uh, alleviate that. And that, um, and that, uh, the, the senator was really helpful. We had a discussion with Mass Dot with Donna Lascalia that related to our discussion about lowering speed limits. And you're talking about lowering speed limits at the high school. I mean, that discussion is ongoing. And um, so just thank you, you know, you're, you're, you're up in the clouds with all of these big bills, but down, you know, that you're available to us at the local level for, you know, just these, these were actually really big things for the constituents in Ward 3, and, and I really appreciate all of the help on that. So. Well, your leadership there made it possible, right? You know, a, a great leader will say, hey, right, so. this is the call you have to make. Um, I know that's real, right? It's real. It's part of what's true about the partnership, right? You know, I'm, I can't, I wouldn't have heard that potentially. Um, but as it turns out, I do understand the idling problem because we have it in Royalston. So I knew what I had to ask for, right. for there. And it is a real problem, right? These engines take upwards of six to eight hours to turn off and then six to eight hours to turn back on. Oh. And this is why we need electric trail, electric rail, you guys. But this is a, this is, um, this is a problem. And so rail companies often think it's more sound to keep them running. Um, and it's truly tricky, right? Because you can sort of intellectually understand what they're going through. Um, but it's not if you're breathing it or hearing it for an entire oh, It's just week. really bizarre to see a train just sitting there, <laughs> yeah. ready to go, hit the gas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for your service there. Um, those things like 
th those are th those are good examples. I'm so they weren't on the list, right? The list it's been five years, so you'd imagine there were more than what I showed you there. And um, Northampton is quite expert, both city councilors and the mayor and your division heads, really expert at chunking out an issue and then going over there, <laughs> you go to that problem. And that's exactly how it works in its best form, this partnership that we have. So my question um, has, so uh, Councillor Dennis Bidwell years ago was talking about doing this with our state reps. And here we are finally getting, <laughs> but um, I, I, I encourage, you know, the, the next council to more routinely do just sort of this. And I, I think through the community resources, through our committee structure, it works better because we kept getting stuck at trying to how, how to have the senator come to our council meeting. And it, I would look at the agenda and I'm just like, oh my God, or, you know, or it's budget season. I think this is a really reasonable way to do it. Um, and, but with the idea, <clears throat> of having a dis discussion about, you know, what is it we can get behind that you're working on? Um, I, I When we have resolutions or take positions on things, it, it, um, Peter would always tell us how important it is to have that re resolution in his back pocket to, to show it to his, you know, his colleagues on the floor. And so... Um, what do you got? What what are what are like three big bills that you would like us to like get behind? So first of all, thank you for raising this. So I'm in to come regularly. We can schedule this now. I will come <laughs> whenever you want me to come. No, it's real. It's real. This is unbelievably useful to me, right? Because if we have a working relationship, then I can better serve the place I love, right? Um, so it's totally great. And I like this too. Uh, you'll know better whether it works for you all. So I defer. Um, uh, and uh, are you talking about Rep. Cocott would say that it was important? It, he, Peter? That, that, Peter that the, when we team up between yes. the local legislature and with yes. our state reps that, you know, that we're all, when we're all pulling in the same direction. And it's totally so true. Can we help? So here's people? how it works, right? <laughs> here's how it works. I say to the Senate president, Senate president, look at these people from Northampton. This is what they're asking me for. And she can understand that. The chair of Ways and Means can understand that different from my heart thinks that we should do this or, you know, even research that tells me that it's an important thing. So, um, you know, among, among the issues, I'll give you a couple of issues that I think are among the uh, top more potentially interesting issues for Northampton. One is a municipal building bill that I have um, filed. I don't believe, I believe the state has to have a stake in municipal buildings. And that's everything from the DPW salt shed to fire stations. Um, Northampton has it better, even though your budget is aching than most, right? But still you have a tax base that has some economic, you know, oomph to it. Um, and you're great stewards of that. Um, but this would create something like the MSBA, the Mass, Mass School Building Authority, or the MBLC, the Library Commission, and it would have a state have a stake in municipal buildings. Um, I think we can do it. I proposed a pay for for this, which is um, taking some of the marijuana excise tax before it hits the general fund. It is an expenditure because that all goes to the general fund, but I'm I'm suggesting in this legislation that we divert it um, as a pay for. We always need a pay for. Um, so that's one thing. Two, um, we have been trying to pass the state ac action for local public health excellence safe grant, uh, the bill, sorry, we passed one during COVID and that's what has set up the public health excellence grants that Northampton now administers, right? You are, thanks to Commissioner O'Leary, you are a district that's now being funded for the first time. God help us, right? We did allow zip codes to determine public health protections before COVID to our shame, oh. right? Now we have skin in the game. I was, I'm proud to have, I'm proud to be part of the fight for that skin, but we need a bill that codifies it. Um, so that bill has passed public health for the, I don't know, 55th time. It was vetoed by our former governor in his misguided sense, um, Governor Baker. 
Uh, it was vetoed while he, in his last moments um, as governor. Um, so we need municipalities to say we need to pass safe into law. It's a very, I mean, uh, Commissioner O'Leary really wants safe. It would just codify the stuff that she's doing and the state's doing, and it would lock in state funding. Um, so that's the second bill um, uh, that I think would be particularly germane to Northampton. Another uh, another area of advocacy as you gear up um, for this budget, it's not necessarily a bill, but it doesn't matter, is the equitable approaches to public safety, the EAPS money. So your Department of Community Care is being funded through EAPS. And this is one of those moments, right? So um, you probably know this. Uh, initially, the city wasn't funded um, for the Department of Community Care. I thought that was a total head scratcher because your process was so profound. Um, I'm glad for Amherst. Amherst was funded, but we asked DPH to sit with Northampton, right? And Elena went through the, the you know, with DPH to understand where, where they were either not understanding Northampton's case or whether or where Northampton could perhaps make a stronger case in DPH's mind, right? We had to hear it. Um, and I was glad that, you know, DPH funded and then funded again um, the equity, you know, the Department of Community Care. We had we invited the commissioner recently to come out um, and was hosted. Commissioner Goldstein was hosted here beautifully by Meredith and her team and the mayor. And Amherst came over, and uh, because we're two of the only non-police crisis response in the Commonwealth, um, to the credit of the municipalities. But this money isn't guaranteed. So, you know, in the last. Uh, I think you know this count, uh, city council president that in the last budget from Governor Healy, for some reason, um, she didn't fund EAPS at all. Not at all. The House funded it at 200000 This would have been devastating for Northampton, which gets about 400 and I'm, I think this is right, 50, 70, 50,000. So it's, you know, not nothing, as they say in budgeting. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were able to rectify that in the Senate. I, you know, that was one of the my priority line items. And, you know, it's about like 3.6 million now, still not enough. So we have to make the case for the governor that equitable approach and and the commissioner, Commissioner Goldstein, that equitable approaches to public safety is making a huge difference in Northampton for the Department of Community Care and that. Northampton is one of the only municipalities doing straight up non-police crisis response, mental health first crisis response, and did it in partnership, you know, with Chief Casper, um, with then Chief Davin, right? Like there was a beautiful partnership that happened that it could be a model for the Commonwealth. And As activists calling, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I think that's an important component of our, our of this city and, and how. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it came out of the, a very robust process. Um, you know, and this is happening across the state. And so, but it's still not solidified in the administration, clearly, because the governor, you know, it wasn't in the governor's budget. And then, you know, so right now it's really in there only because of the Senate. And that's not where Northampton wants it um, going forward. So those are three ideas of many of where you could be very powerful Let's get this budget out of, let's get the bill to fund municipal buildings out of committee. Let's finally pass the state action for local public health excellence. And let's let's really urge the governor to incorporate the equitable approaches to public safety into her idea of mental health, public health, public safety. Um, those three things are, you know, three of umpteen where Northampton is uniquely poised, I think, to say something you're uniquely poised for public health because Meredith is a rock star um, and you're running a region. You're uniquely poised for EAPS because you're doing the work um, that is now stipulated. We changed um, Javier Luango Garrido was actually instrumental in helping me get, and he's a Northampton constituent. He got, he worked with our team to get the right language that would privilege Northampton. Meaning I, we had to make sure that it, co-response is important in the whole continuum, but it's not non-police crisis response. And so co-response is funded out of DMH. This is funded out of DPH, mm -hmm. all the acronyms. And so we had to get, we had to privilege the mental health crisis response in the language. And Javier, Javier worked with me 
to get that. So we got that passed in the Senate and then we got it funded, but it it needs to be like it needs to not just hang on the person in the Senate. Right. We, we want that more. We want the governor and the DPH commissioner to think, yeah, this is like important stuff. Now, I think Commissioner Goldstein was wowed when he came here. And I think that the mayor recently wrote him a gorgeous level, a uh, gorgeous level, gorgeous letter um, when um, the Department of Communi Community Care was stood up. Um, and she sent him this report and it was really beautiful. Um, but still, there's work for the city council to do. Um, I'm I'm sitting here listening and I'm wondering that looking ahead to 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 next term. Uh um and I'm wondering if it makes sense for council to consider um uh adding uh a, a, the a, a an appointment uh as a liaison. Um maybe asking to be in some of these meetings in the mayor's office, uh you know, to, to the legislative uh, to the legislature. Um, because I think because I, I, I it's exactly right and and it's not always the um the the mayor's office is balancing so much but i can say for my part i've when i've had i've had a couple of opportunities now to to testify on 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 bills um and it, it was one of the things that i think is that is happening in the city that is really great is that the nesc is um really good about uh we have uh uh just great you know it's our constituent she's not even on the commission adele franks like yeah. keeps us totally she is a rock star she's rock a rock stars. star and um and uh and she she's able to tell us what's going on and what's important to um you know to to, to weigh in on and for that commission's work and it's it's charge and i think that um that level of involvement and in, and in understanding what's going on at the legislative at the state level um it, with somebody ready even if it's not the liaison who always would necessarily go and fill in that role but to say we were there we will write the letter we will testify we will um do that and and it it is also worth noting that i think often the the sort of council prerogative when there's consensus is you know i we're we're you know we're 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 a group or we're, we're not a single voice so we may not always agree or speak with one voice um and our council prerogative may not always exactly match the mayor's um but within that there's still a role i think to advocate and and i think there's a way to do it without getting stepping on people's feet and and you know making sure all sides are heard and facilitating and where there is consensus especially making sure that we're bringing all the tools to bear um and and going and speaking to these issues i i do think that counselors at the legislative level the municipal level bring something to the conversation that the the executives that's different than the executive function um when they come and speak so oh infinitely true right like you are um you have great gravitas in, in hearings because I think many, many of my colleagues at the state level believe what I do, that your job is harder than anybody's here. Um, and I would welcome, I mean, I will defer to Mayor Shara in terms of the setup, but um, I would welcome a closer relationship with the council completely. And whether that's, you know, appointing someone to come to these mayor meetings or actually having a separate meeting with me, depending on what works better, that's terrific. Um, and then, you know, Elena really is pretty good at getting out uh, where where we think the opportunities are the most acute or or urgent. We do try to get them out to um, to city councilors or select boards, but you know that person could perhaps listen for those um, or meet with us. You know, so we could work it out. So the answer is yes. If the council wishes, um, I think it would be super great to do that. I think that would be great. I get those. I get the emails from Elena. My sense is, is they go out to all of us. And so I, I think there's a little bit of a, well, is this, is this just me? Like, who's going to pick up this ball and run with it? Is it, yeah. um, and it might within our body make sense to, to, uh, to have somebody be like, that's, that's, that's our ball to pick up or, or to delegate or to discuss if, if we are going to, you know, do anything about it and maybe kind of make a, make a point of it. I love it. Centralize that. Council Mayor. Yeah. Well, now I have had a question, but now I'm thinking. 
thing idea yeah maybe somehow like we'll talk about it but chairs or some because i was thinking each committee actually has a vested interest like you know nesc as well as have you as you've seen um we utilize Adele Franks to play that role sometimes informally, but like each committee kind of has its own vested interests. So we'd have to think about that, but that's quite interesting. But yeah, so connected, I was, you know, I've always been curious, Senator, about um, your experience, the experience from your end of home rule petitions. Sometimes I feel almost sheepish about it. Like, you know, it's like a credit rating and we keep pinging it and it's like a headache for you. I just was curious how it, how it plays out for you uh, when you have to carry out something that we initiate, basically. Oh, um, thank you for that question. Yeah. There's no end to your credit here, right? <laughs> You're going to have that um, <laughs> that um, metaphor. It's a, uh, so, you know, I think of home rules as actually one of the more important pieces of work because that's you as city councilors or select boards telling the legislature, hey, you guys, like, we got to get this done. And unfortunately, we need you to let us do it, right? Um, I'm thinking a lot along with, you know, great house members about what to do, for example, of these age extensions, which are troubling, you know, to me. And because I I don't think it's really, I think 65 is the new 45 as I approach 65. <laughs> so like, so, but that's one thing, but, um, but I just, I think we could do better at uh, helping municipalities not have to come to us all the time for these home rules. But that aside, um, I, the home rules are great. Home rules are are important. They you are telling the legislature what you need to do your business, um, and that's fine. Sometimes, as you know, um, Northampton is ahead of a lot of the state. So, for example, uh, with um, non citizen voting in municipal elections. I support that personally. I, I support the charter's work. I was proud to be in the city when that happened. I'm proud to have the home rule. Um, and the legislature's not there yet, you know? So that's painful to have, to think that uh, we may not be able to move that simply because the legislature isn't where Northampton is. But by Northampton saying publicly, this is where we are, you are signaling to some other communities that are similar um, and or signaling to the Senate leadership that it or and House leadership that it needs to understand that not all communities are of the 351 are the same. And that's very useful. Um, because again, you know, and if you think about democracy as a, the most beautiful bottom up, like people to us at the municipal level, to the state, to the federal government, you know, when Northampton signals through an, an official body that you have an official position, um, that's amazing. Um, and everything you do to crow about that and speak about it publicly and push us in the legislature um, is really important. Um, it's very important. I, again, I, I, you know, I'm sure Rep. Sabadosa joins me in wishing we could pass some of these reforms that you're asking for, and we will, you know, we'll keep pushing because you're going to tell us to keep pushing. Um, well, it's true we have a lot of harmony here. I, I guess it would be more painful for you if we were playing really ridiculous home <laughs> petitions for it. So perhaps, perhaps that makes it easier. But um, yeah. I do feel like what's challenging from the council level is the the time frame. So sometimes yeah. a sponsor will not like no longer be serving by the time, you know, it rolls around. So for me, it's maintaining my attention. If I introduce a home rule petition, making sure that I keep following it. And Elaine has been, is very responsive and very proactive. And I really appreciate that. Um, so anyway, um, anything about that process that we, you think we could um, kind of improve on? I'm always open to hearing about. Well, I mean, it is, it's a long arc. Right. Um, but, you know, again, and I, I think you can, Council Mayori, I think I said this before you came in, which is, you know, House members have a bigger lift in home rules. So I, you know, I, I recognize Rep. Sabadosa's work because they often, not always, but almost always go in on the House side first. And that's, you know, we have, again, I said, we have a role to play. Like I can't be snoozing right. um, um, through these and I hopefully am a good partner. Right. Um, but, you know, going in on the House side is, you know, a disproportionate 
lift. Well, I'll, I'll make I'll make a note to ask Rep Sabados that question too because yeah. I've been curious about it. It's one of the few times we generate something really truly from the ground level, and it's and I don't know how it feels on every other level. Yeah. So that's interesting. So, Thank you. You know, last year you filed ten home rules, four passed, and one became unnecessary following the election law bill. So it's basically um, five. The, the legislature acted on 50% of what Northampton wanted. Um, that's not bad, Odd Is that a good average? <laughs> um, it's, not bad. it's not bad compared to some other of the communities I represent. Um, uh, this year you have eight in so far. Um, and so far means that I welcome more of them. Um, and um, And they're doing well in terms of hearings. You know, we always want to see them click through the process, but you know they are welcome, as far as I'm concerned. It's your it's your right to exercise um, your request of the state. Do we exercise it more than other communities? Uh, yes, but you're bigger than some of the other communities I represent. I mean, here's a here's a, just a quick sidebar on democracy, right? So I have community, I have colleagues, you know, who represent, a, you know, a set of blocks in Boston, right? Um, their home rules are weeny compared to the number of home rules I have. And in the Senate, I am looking at this with the Senate president. I do worry about representation because as the district gets bigger and the square miles gets bigger, the number of people doesn't get bigger. It's like 175, 180 roughly um, per uh, 1,000 per senator. Um, but the number of like touches grows. Um, the number of home rules grows. And that's just, I think we have to be aware of that, awake of that, you know, to the Western Mass senators. Because if we're not, we could get ourselves into a position where our districts are so large that we are not able to do the same kind of quality service that some other senators do. Because they have, you know, a tiny geographic area, one police chief, one fire, you know, one fire chief, something like that. You know, it's just real. (laughs) And a quicker commute. Right. So there's things I'm watching. Um, in terms of just the, again, this is why we should all care about population loss in West, which one of the things, reasons besides economics, that we should care about population loss is the democracy factor for us. Thank you. Um, I'm really appreciating this conversation and especially those those bills that you uh, want us to to advocate with you on. Um, I wanted to circle back to education yeah. and some things you mentioned there. First, do you happen to know the percentage of special education that Northampton has as a, you know, yes. compared to that 16%? Yes, I do. I'm going to look that up, Counselor. I should have had it on the tip of my tongue. I, uh, I feel like it's something I should know. Um, but the my so my question is, yeah, wh- where are we in that? But you, you also mentioned that you know, chapter 70 funds that we funded all of that through um, the regular budget and not through the fair share amendment. But I think we all know that it's, that it's certainly insufficient for Northampton. Yes. Um, and, and how much of that is about special education? Cause I know we have a disproportionate uh, or, you know, a higher number um, than others. And, how, it's a perennial question. How can we get the legislature, the governor, to recognize the situation that Northampton is in? Um, and yeah. how can we help you advocate for that? So I'm so glad you raised that. And it was in my notes, and I didn't touch on it enough, Councillor Jarrett. Um, so as you all know, the Student Opportunity Act, which we passed in 2019 was long overdue, right? Education reform was 25 years before, God help us. And it really had languished school spending. And I voted yes, just so you know, for the Student Opportunity Act, I would vote yes again. And that bill disproportionately helped low income, high immigrant, um, high poverty, Uh, high community of color um, schools, right? It privileges those communities. That had to happen, had to happen. Um, Because really like public health, 
you know, was we were trying to fix that with my bill, the uh, uh, safe bill, state action for local public health excellence. The Student Opportunity Act was trying to address the fact that zip codes were determining the quality of students' public education, right? Because um, we didn't have a foundation budget or a process that would allow the state to have a bigger skin in the game. So that's important, and it was important. Um, and there were a cohort, there are a cohort of schools, including districts like Northampton, and then all of the rural schools, um, like Amherst, Mohawk, Pioneer, that were completely left out of the huge gains of the Student Opportunity Act. They're getting some gains, right? Some gains, but they're not getting the kind of meteoric gains that Springfield, Chelsea, Fall River, Brockton, places that I think I'm, I think I know you all well enough to know, we all want these districts to get more state money. We're all better when there is, you know, racial and economic justice. So, you know, so a, a little while ago, um, I brought out Secretary Pat Tutwiler, who is just a wonderful man. He's the new education secretary, Governor Healy's education secretary. He's a wonderful guy. And um, he and his folks came out uh, and I partnered with the Collaborative for Educational Services to have him out. And the mayor met him at Bridge Street. And um, and it was a beautiful visit. And one of the reasons I felt such urgency to bring him was because Northampton has long been understood to not benefit as fully from the Student Opportunity Act, and yet we don't have a good fix yet for why that is. So let's table that for a second. The other thing that's happening with Northampton is, so Northampton is classically called a minimum aid district, right? It's a minimum aid district. What does that mean? It means that in ed reform, Northampton can't get less Chapter 70 money. Chapter 70 is how we fund the foundation budget, the state's portion than it did the year before. That's good. Um, but it what has happened is that it has told a sort of almost a false story to the city council and mayors over time. It said, basically, you're going to get this minimum aid, but it hasn't told you that your declining population is such that um, as the Student Opportunity Act is rolled in, um, it is being undercut by what's called a buffer. Actually, I'm going to do something a little bit crazy, but I'm going to draw a graph for all of you. Is that okay, Mr. Chair? Yeah. No. Yes, I've, right. yeah. um, it's actually, it's it's impossible. It's impossible to actually see this um, unless we see this on a graph. Um, all right. So um, this is a terrible graph. Um, this is uh, population and this is dollars, right? So here's your minimum aid and minimum aid over time has been going up, um, but only slightly like 1%, 2%, not like inflation. So it's bananas, not. Can you put your camera on, oh on your God, screen? And... Yes, I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. What a good idea. No, minimum aid is calculated per student. Oh, there you go. So this is your minimum aid. So it's been going up a little, little, little bit, right? Your population has been declining. Like last year, our schools, not your, mine, right? My kids are in Northampton Public Schools. Um, well, one's in Smith Vocational now, but my son is in the high school. So our population has been declining. That's because of a number of things. Population of students writ large. Um, the impact of homeschooling, the impact of charters, like we know this, right? We we understand this. You guys know this better than I do. So that's been going down, but you haven't seen, you haven't seen the impact because you're a minimum aid district. So enter Student Opportunity Act, right? Where we're starting to see this. See, the problem is I can't see my drawing unless I've got my glasses on. <laughs> we're starting to see this, this increase in spending but we've got this thing called, I've talked to the, the mayor buffer. about this, a hold harmless buffer. <laughs> 
So we've got this thing called a hold harmless buffer that's increased over time because um, we've lost kids, but you've still been getting the minimum amount. We've still been getting the minimum amount. So we've got this buffer. So the Student Opportunity Act money has to eat through hold harmless. Um, so think of it like a big Pac-Man, right? It has to chomp, 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 chomp all the way through this buffer. Now, um, in districts like the Brockton, you know, Student Opportunity Act was meteoric, right? It went up, you know, it went up by leaps because things like um, income, things like immigrant status, um, uh, immigration status were considered in the algorithm. So the algorithm is 12 points. Northampton is five or six. I think you're six. Um, so right in the middle. So it's neither like no gain or meteoric. It's like this slow chug, not slow, but it's a chug. And it's over seven years. Some of it's over seven years, some of it's over five years. So it's still getting implemented. So even as it's still getting implemented, you are, we are seeing this hold harmless buffer. So it's increasing in theory, but it hasn't broken through the minimum aid. Um, whereas, you know, if districts were increasing population, then you would, excuse me, be minimum aid districts and Student Opportunity Act would just be rocketing up from there. Instead, we're eating, Pac-Man is eating through this buffer. That's a problem, right? There are some districts I'm here to tell you in our, some school districts in our Senate district, where probably, unless we fix the Student Opportunity Act, which is, I, I wanna fix it with special education, um, we'll never, they'll never make it through. Their minimum aid buffer is so great. But every time we, this district loses a kid, we risk that that buffer becomes bigger. Yeah, so uh, that, that was my question about special education and the so that's what so, so it's not considered so the special education would simply like if we if we fixed what I think we should fix in special education, mm -hmm. then Northampton, you know, would be more of a robust, like sort of a more of a steep incline. Mm -hmm. Because if we're allowing all of our districts to count the actual number of kids on IEPs, um if we put that into the formula, that would necessitate um, that Northampton get more money. You'd have to also, like there's like a double-edged sword, right? Because there would be an increase in, in your foundation budget of which Northampton pays a part of, right? As you know, but ultimately it would benefit Northampton mm -hmm. because your, your increase would be high, more rapid. Okay. But school population is everything. Um, and Student Opportunity Act reforms. And actually, I should have, Council Jared, mentioned the special education bill before the um, Joint Committee on Education. So that has had a hearing. Um, and, um, you know, it simply says that, and there's also the rural schools bill. So Rep. Lay and I have the rural schools bill. That hearing is up. Um, I think at the end of October, it hasn't been noticed yet. We'll get it out to all municipalities that has the special education component in it. So I filed it as a separate bill with Rep. Carey, and then I filed this the rural bill with Rep. Lay. Um, and it has it in there because why? Well, because all the rural school superintendents said special education is the way out of this because we can't um, we can't we can't pay for the kids where well, they want to. You want to, right? Um, but it's just so expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And and would that funding come from the regular budget or from the fair share amendment funds or does it matter? It doesn't really matter. Yeah. I mean, it matters. It's funded. Yeah, it matters because we want, for example, universal school meals. So as long as our revenue stays strong and our general fund can fund, you know, education, chapter 70, then we should do that um, and then pay for all the other stuff that we're paying for. But ultimately, money... It, in that thing, in that idea that money is fungible and it's in a big pot, um, doesn't really matter. Yeah. Well, you know, I encourage you to to let us know when the optimal time is to put our support behind. I will. We will. The, I think it, it talking this through is very helpful, and I think we'll 
uh, we'll certainly write you when the rural school bill is up. And the, just so you know, the rural school bill will have this special education component in it. Um, and um, I will tell you a hard truth. And I, I know, Mr. Chair, I should probably wrap up, right? I'm, I'm, I am enjoying this conversation and I do have a couple questions. Okay. Um, the, the very hard truth about special education in the Commonwealth is that the prevailing thought is that um, municipalities will use students on IEP, it's hard, even hard to say, as ways to pad their budget. Now, I think council knows, the school committee knows, I know that that's really far from the truth. Right now, we actually fight, face, our schools face a downward pressure, right? We know that every kid over a 16% threshold, um, and by the way, 16% isn't actually accurate. The, the state thinks that each kid on an IEP needs uh, special education services for a quarter of a day. So uh, it's a little bananas too, by the way. And, um, but that's something we have to fix. So it's like four times four is 16, right? Um, so it's really four, they, they assume that the threshold's actually four. And then we multiply that by four because it's a quarter of a kid and we get 16. Um, they, we know that's not true, right? We know that there's downward pressure to deny kids IEPs because districts are terrified of the money um, that they have to expend. So it's short, they're just trying to survive and give the kids education. So the idea that they would be trying to use these kids to um, to pad their budgets is just simply wrong. I, I, I haven't worked with your new superintendent, our new superintendent, as much as I, I look forward to, but I know Dr. Provost found that idea so repugnant because he believes in the least restri restrictive setting for students. That's good pedagogy. And, you know, so they don't, they don't want, if they don't have to give a kid services, they don't not want to give a kid services because they don't want to, they want to, they're afraid of padding the budget. They don't want that kid to have service. They want the kid to be mainstream because that's the least restrictive setting in which the kid can thrive. And that's ultimately better for kids on IEPs. And so it's a very backward thought at the state, but it is absolutely the thought. And I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that, but that's true. So it really needs like city councils to be outraged that you're paying, you know, um, the amount you are when the state is assuming a threshold that is so far below. By the way, do you know who has a threshold at or below 16%? The W's, Wellesley, Winchester, you know, Wayland, Lexington, Concord, Arlington, Newton. They're wealthy. They're disproportionately wealthy and privileged, right? Who doesn't have those thresholds, right? Smor smaller, poorer towns um, and some larger communities, right? So it's like such nonsense. We know it correlates a lot with wealth and access. Um, it's just well, really maybe if you brought in some illegal immigrants into your town, maybe they'd uh, get oh, more opportunities a, too. I had a feeling that that Mike. <laughs> well, we yes, we I won't address that comment, Mr. Chair, unless okay, very good. We need to bring in more illegal immigrants into our town, I think, and then we well, need to help. Nobody's even doing anything for the whiteboard, and There's we need to so use our taxpayers' money. money. Okay. Apologize for that. No, no. It's, you don't it get to on things very often. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I look, you know, honestly, these, they're great divergent thoughts that are, you know, are welcome. I hear things in my mm -hmm. inbox. And in my own voicemail, um, like the good person who made his views known. Uh, oh, hold on. Um, can, while we're doing this, Council of the Barge, I wanted you to know that I got your end of life options question, and I so much appreciate your advocacy, Councillor, on that. The hearing for that bill is uh, Friday. It is a bill um, for the city council to know um, Councillor Barge has been a beautiful advocate for. It would allow people who have received a terminal diagnosis of six months or fewer to work with their doctor on an end of life plan um, on their own terms. It is a bill I'm proud to have filed. 
um, for the last four years. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so thank you for that. And um, it, the hearing's Friday. It's been passed out favorably twice. So I'm hoping that we three times the charm and it gets over the line. So I have just a couple questions, kind of statements. Um, one is that in one of the slides I saw there was talk about economic development. Um, I saw small businesses, creative tourism, and just being the rap representative I am, I have been thinking a lot and working on ways to kind of think of our area regionally. You know, I love not only Northampton, but I think that we have a lot of things in our surrounding communities. Um, you know, so I've been trying to work on ways to to make this whole area more alluring. And I was wondering if you've been thinking about ways to connect the communities that you represent uh, together. And, and Yeah, no, I'm so happy you're thinking that. And Northampton, as a regional tourism council, you know, Vince and plays a great role. Um, and I love that you're leading that, too. Um, um, so, yes, I do think a lot about economic development and connecting communities, especially so far in arts and culture. Um, Michael Bobbitt, who is the executive director of Mass Cultural, um, I've brought him to the to the district now three times for tours that always involve the chambers and the bids and the um, arts and culture community. Um, uh, actually, four times um, he's been here. And, you know, I do think about MCC funding as really critical to us um, in the well-being of everything from, you know, 33 Hawley to um, historic Northampton, you know, um, they are a big economic engine for us. Um, uh, there is a new uh, uh, travel tourism director, Kate Fox, and I'm working with um, Secretary Yvonne Howe to bring Kate to the region. And I was imagining you know, linking the Greenfield Chamber and uh, BID and Regional Tourism Council, the Amherst folks and the Northampton folks in that conversation to have to really talk about what Northampton has to offer um, and the re what the region has to offer. Um, and, you know, I think that's going to be really, really important um, as we both get to know Kate, but also Director Fox, but as we also you know, get to know better Secretary Howe um, and Undersecretary Stolba, who love Northampton um, and appreciate, you know, the district itself, but, you know, could and should um, be invited in to see us as a region. So Jesse Dean is the executive director of Franklin County Chamber. She's new-ish, not so new anymore. And then, of course, Claudia and Gabby, Gabrielle from Amherst, um, you know, all of those folks, plus, of course, Vince um, and Jillian um, and you, um, you know, I'm excited to work with together as a more of a team in the coming months. Well, I, I look forward to those moments as well. That would be cool. Um, and then so the other thing that had just been on my mind is that, um, you know, Northampton is, is trying to be at the forefront of a, of a lot of things. And uh, one thing that myself and Councilor Elkins are working on is this commission to study racialized harms for Black um, residents and workers. And part of one of our tasks that we were recently given was to look at what other communities are doing. Um, and I was tasked with looking at, at Boston, in fact, and they have a reparations task force there that kind of just started. And I was wondering, uh, have you had any interaction with, with those folks or? I have not. Um but I do know, so thank you for that work. Um, I do, I have heard from other places in our district that are interested um, uh, in reparations. Like so certainly the Amherst folks are looking at this. There are folks in the sort of Leverett, uh, Shootsbury area looking at this and then now Northampton. Um, so I have been tuned in to the efforts locally. I, I am not tuned in to what Boston is doing. I'm more tuned in to the, there's a statewide movement that folks like Senator Miranda, Liz Miranda, has been helping to lead, who's, she's a fabulous senator, and we are really lucky to have her um, working. So I, I'm more tuned in there than I am into the city of Boston under Mayor Wu, who is also fabulous. Um, but, you know, any connection the city wants me to make, right, um, that's my job. So I could help find out in the Wu administration who the right people are or join you. So just you simply follow up with an email to the Senate address and we can get working on that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, 
I did want to give a little time, if you have just a little more time. Um, I know that there are a couple counselors who are here remotely. And um, would any of the counselors who are remote like to ask any questions? Councilor LaBarge. Yep, thank you. Um, Senator, I want to thank you for being at our meeting this evening. It's a pleasure to hear the breakdown of the budget. I've learned a lot from this this evening, but I also want to thank you for who you are. I have to say, when I looked at the listing that you presented this evening, constituents and services, in my heart, I want to thank you. I invited you to come to see a resident of mine last year who's worked all his life, all his life, saved all his money, and never asked anybody for anything. I went to you and I stated to you that I needed you to come to see a resident of mine who was diagnosed with cancer very badly. You came and I told you before we went in the house, your eyes are gonna tell you everything. And I always say that. And when you stayed there, you heard my resident talk. You saw the condition that he was in and the house that he lives in. I got him a new roof by our previous um, state rep, Peter Colcott, Senator Rosenberg, you were there, you saw the condition. And that meant a lot to me to see the Senator come, which my resident was so happy that you came to see him. And he still talks about you. And then when you left the house, you said to me outside, you know, Consular, your eyes do tell it all. And that you needed to do more about visiting residents. And that's what this is all about. No matter if you're a state rep, a senator, you need to get out and see residents and see the needy people that need help in our city and probably other communities also. But I just wanted to let you know that he talks about you a lot, a lot. And that means a lot to me as his counselor. And I wanna thank you, Senator Comfort, for who you are. Thank you. Well, Counselor Labarge, Honestly, that is deeply moving to me. And, you know, you like, you know, when Councillor Nash pointed me to a problem, um, you point me to constituents who need justice and need deeper levels of service and respect. Um, and, you know, when I was there, most of the conversation, Councillor the Barge was about you um, and your help to this constituent. Um, so thank you for all you do in your service, truly. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Seeing none. Do you, yes, oh, Councilor Jerry. That's okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't know how long we were planning on going. I feel like we could probably go all <laughs> night. But I have <laughs> we have so many things to so <laughs> talk to you about. Um, I wanted to circle back to something else you mentioned uh, relating housing and transit. And, um, you know, we've in Northampton, we've gained about a thousand people and about population loss uh, over 10 years from 20, the 2010 census to the 2020 census. And um, <clears throat> sustainable development is very important to us. We've recently passed zoning changes that allow for um, increased development housing of housing in the downtown areas. And um, so I guess my question, out east, we see transit-oriented development mm -hmm. around uh, areas. You know, we know that in that folks who are living in the downtown areas are much less likely to have a car or have fewer cars um, to use transit. <clears throat> but our transit here is not sufficient to really build a life around like you could in Eastern Mass in yes. some of the areas. And so how do we get, thinking long-term here, how do we get you know, the increased population without getting the increased traffic? Um, and as I see it, the way we have to do that is to build, is to create a, a city that where you can 
build your life or build much of your life uh, without having to use a private car for everything. And But there's a lot of chicken and egg going on yeah. where you don't have the transit, so you have to rely on the car. You, you, you can't, we can't build the, the housing and because we have to supply parking and that takes up a bunch of space. So there's a lot of things like that. And I'm curious, just kind of your long-term thoughts yeah. um, on, on the subject. Such an important question, counselor. Um, so the governor's coming out with a housing bond bill. Um, I believe we'll see it very soon. Um, I hope she addresses some of these questions um, by things like allowing uh, cities to raise money locally. I have a bill, a luxury real estate transfer tax um, that would give Northampton the option of adopting it as a local revenue source. Um, I'm hoping the governor sees fit to include that in her housing bill as just among a whole toolkit of financial options for Northampton, but you're right that it's a chicken and an egg. I will say in this um, in this last budget, we the legislature appropriated record money for RTAs mm -hmm. for the first time. Yeah, you know RTAs will have a pretty astounding level of funding, including PVTA and FRTA, which are um, key for our part of the Connecticut River Valley. Also MRTA and and the Berkshire service. Um, and I'm hoping with that, that we see a great deal of innovation, um, like we're doing up in Franklin County with those earmarks I was able to snag. They're doing this really unbelievable public Uber, essentially, that is really making it possible. Now it's a small pilot, so it's for a very small, small-ish pilot. It's a, for a cohort of service users. So people going to GCC, people needing healthcare at the community health center, people involved in community action programs. So like a contained group of people, but they're using it. They're using it multiple times a day. Um, it's pretty damn darn cheap. Sorry, everybody. It's pretty darn cheap. Um, and uh, I know Senator Kurz is on the um, uh, pretty darn cheap. And I think we have to see that as one of the solutions for us here, right? Because our, our you know, the fact that we don't have night, you know, credible enough night service, weekend service, enough stops, enough frequency, enough, you know, intersecting county routes, um, us to Hamden and Franklin and them to each other, you know, so that's really makes it very difficult, as you've already said, to, to try to not uh, have a car. Um, uh, and getting back to the governor's housing bond bill, I, I hope there's other pieces of policy in there that will incentivize a denser housing development that um, we, in the tax package uh, that we passed that I talked about br very briefly, we put in um, money for the low income housing tax credit. That's a really important tax credit. It's built the gables. It helped build the gables in um, Amherst. It's building the Wilson Gr department store up in Greenfield. Um, the nursing home will use it. Valley CDC will use it when we get that. Um, finally funded um, from Housing and Livable Communities. They sh should have been funded already. Um, so we need we need that kind of um, money as well to be much more significantly funded in the bond bill, along with housing policy that will help local communities raise, but also help there to be a denser um, infill. I believe in um, that we need that for all of our communities. Um, and uh, I think I think that's kind of the one-two punch you're talking about. More money, um, an ability to go denser, um, and then the kind of infrastructure money that's for our communities out here, it's water sewer, right? 30% of the Commonwealth is on septic and wells. Mm -hmm. That 30% is out here, not here, not in Northampton. But, you know, we need infrastructure and transit and um, uh, the grid, the, the grid and cell in order to be able to densify the housing. So that has to be part of what she's thinking about. I think she is. Yeah. And is there a um, the question of, for that housing bond bill? Do you know how much of that will support the capital A affordable housing, that less than 80% of area median income 
and uh, versus how much will support people who are above that who are yeah, the workforce housing um <clears throat> yeah and you know we're not seeing the mechanisms to to fund that to and and to keep it um to, to maintain affordability at something that's greater than 80%, which yep. is desperately needed here. Yep. Um, so in the Senate's, in the House and Senate's tax package, there was a what's called HDIP. It's a workforce housing for gateway cities. Um, so we did invest in that. It's pretty controversial, actually, because it, HDIP in itself doesn't have an affordability mandate. So people are worried that that's going to go to all middle and upper middle working houses, working homes. Um, uh, so that's something to think about. But I, I believe the governor is has got to be thinking of both, you know, really affordable, low income, middle income workforce um, housing in as in her toolkit, and I think she. You know, because we just did something for HDIP for the Gateway Cities, I'm I'm hoping that she sees the rest of the Commonwealth in her bond bill. But here's an here's an invitation, and I I can't believe I didn't say this to you, Councillor. Northampton should say, you know, when that bond bill comes out, if it works for you, mm -hmm. you know, and um, and you know, certainly uh, Pamela Schwartz in the Western Mass Network to End Homelessness is a I find her a great resource. Keith Ferry um, is a supreme um, uh, asset um, brain in this space from Wayfinders. So certainly, you know, we will have some time right, because the housing bond bill will have to go to the housing, Joint Committee on Housing. And we just brought Senator Edwards here, Lydia Edwards, so she could see the challenges that we face. She's unbelievable. So um, many people from our area, including um, um, Valley CDC, you know, just sort of, and Keith sort of poured their brains into Senator Edwards in preparation for this housing bond bill. So we'll have to go to housing and then I'll have to go to bonding. So two joint committees. So there'll be time for Northampton to tell me and tell those committees, hey, this works, this doesn't work for us. Yeah. Um, and so, because it'll have to go to two committees and then it'll have to come to the floor um, and where I can file amendments. Hopefully we get it in before, right? It's always better, by the way, to bake it in to the base um, than fight it out on the floor, but we can do that too. Um, so let's let's look at what you're, let's look for what you are asking us to look for here. Um, you know, and have that could be one of the, yet yeah, one more piece of follow-up for the city council. Hey, Joe, this doesn't work for us. This is what would work for us. Or you could testify directly, um, you know, and flag that. I would right. suggest that, and particularly in, in issues of housing, um, that this committee is uh, is an excellent place to have those discussions. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I, Senator, I would encourage you, and, and we'll be on the lookout too, but if, if something is something coming some, if something's coming down the pike that has a particular is going to have a particular impact on housing um and and policy around that and we will have a take on it or that or that we might have you know that we might have a take on I, you know we would take it up in a community resources meeting and um and and really get wonky about it i think i think there's enough <laughs> interest in that that we, we would we would get into the into the weeds on something like that well i mean it's coming it's coming probably this week Okay. Oh, great. Okay. Um, I I don't know for sure because I'm not the governor, but um, what? True. <laughs> Simply the person who serves you in the Senate. But um, but I think do take a look at that. This is my invitation to you to take a look at that and then sound alarm bells or cheers, depending. Like keep this, take the you know fix this. And again, if if this if this committee wanted to, um send that directly in, a, you know, in writing from the council, right? Um, that's also super welcome. Or the mayor, again, you know, I would defer to you all to know exactly how to work best with Mayor Shara. Yeah. Well, I would, you know, I don't know what November looks like for this committee, but potentially I uh, could, you know, discuss the housing bond bill and see where we go from there in the November agenda. I like it. You know that? Yeah. Um, 
I just want to thank you again, Senator Comfort, for joining us, for educating us, for doing all the hard work that you do. Oh, um, and I hope that this will be the first of many visits to community resources or this way so we can learn more because um, there's always stuff to learn. Well, it was my honor, truly. And thank you for having me, Mr. Chair and committee. Um, and, you know, I, really, I will come back as much as you ask me. Um, it'll be it would be really fun. And I really like Councillor Elkins. Um, suggestion of your suggestion of you know if the council sees fit in your next incarnation to say okay you you know one of you you have to you know go to the you know again working with the mayor go to these mayor meetings or um or have a separate meeting or Whatever you want, whatever the council wants um, and the mayor wants, I'm happy to do. And Councillor Jarrett, I, I, if it's impossible to believe, but I don't have the special education table at a place where I can pull it up. My dock is not opening and I don't want to futz with it anymore and take my attention away from sure. the meeting. I will get it for you Thanks. as a piece of follow-up. Um, so it's it's... For some reason, it's like the, it's saying that it's not. A, I'm not able to open this file, sure. so I'm going to write myself a note. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you yes. very very much. Yes, thank I you. Appreciate you so much. Thank you again. Thank you for your patience. Um, well, that brings us to the last few items. There are no items referred to this committee. Does anyone have any new business they want to bring up? Well, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I would move to adjourn. Second. Now that everyone's here, do we need to take a roll call vote or can we just? Oh, we don't have to. Have a, uh... oh, yeah. I will. Aye. Aye. All in favor. Aye. Hey. Aye. That was perfect. Thank you again, everyone.